So in the last lecture, we talked about glaciers and different uh, landscape features that glaciers carve out through erosion. And today we're going to continue talking about glacial geomorphology and we're going to get a little bit more into some more different uh, glacial landforms and how we can use this to learn about past glacier behavior. Um, so we'll start by talking about different depositional landforms, so landforms that are created when glaciers deposit sediment. Uh, we'll talk about bed forms that are created underneath the glacier, so these are uh, landforms that are created at the bed of the glacier. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about paleoglaciology and ice sheet reconstruction, and then we'll talk a little bit about past glaciation in Ireland. So just to recap from the previous lecture, so glaciers, remember, are large masses of snow and ice that flow under their own weight. They erode or produce sediment through abrasion and plucking. So plucking is where they uh, sort of break off small pieces of rock. Um, and abrasion is where those small pieces of rock scrape the underlying uh, bedrock as the glacier is flowing over it. Uh, this erosion or glacial erosion produces large-scale landforms, such as glacial valleys, um, and the sediment produced by glaciers, which is broadly called glacial drift, is transported as the ice flows, and then it gets deposited when the ice melts out. And if it's deposited by the ice itself, we call it till, and if it's deposited by meltwater, we call it stratified drift. So if you look here uh, at this figure, uh, you can see just a schematic view of a large retreating glacier or ice sheet. And then we have some different uh, landforms that are created as that glacier retreats or are revealed as that glacier retreats, um, as well as uh, some other features that we'll um, continue talking about throughout this lecture. But if you go to this link here, uh, you can see a, a video that talks about all of these as well. So starting sort of at the very end of the glacier or the very end of where a glacier um, advances to, we have what are called moraines. And moraines are uh, really any accumulation of unconsolidated glacial drift. Um, so this is just sort of loose piles of debris that have not really been compacted. Um, they often form as large linear ridges, but that's not always the case. Um, you can have, uh, as I'll mention in a minute, uh, you can have moraines that are sort of spread out over large areas. Um, when moraines form on the glacier surface, they're called medial moraines. Uh, I showed an example in the previous lecture uh, the schematic of the glacier flowing down out of a mountain, and there's a thin stripe of sediment that, um, that appears on the surface of the glacier. This is a medial moraine, uh, and a medial moraine is formed when two different lateral, lateral moraines um, sort of get moved to the middle of the glacier as two different glaciers flow together, or a tributary flows into a larger glacier. Um, when they occur off the glacier, they're called lateral moraines. So these are moraines that appear at the side of the glacier. Um, at the end of the glacier, so where the terminus is, we can call them either terminal or end moraines. And these are formed at the maximum advance of the glacier. Um, so this e example here from uh, Halsjöka in Iceland shows where a shows where this this uh, outlet glacier of that ice cap has advanced or the farthest most recent advance of the glacier um, that's this line uh, shown here um, as the glacier retreats it may stabilize and stay in the same position for some period of time and form a new moraine and that might be what we call 
those are what we call recessional moraines. So these are moraines that are formed as the glacier is retreating from its maximum advanced position. Um, and you can see some examples shown here on this map. Uh, and then finally, we might have what are called ground moraines. And these are just large, uh, not really piles, but just sort of sheets of glacial debris that have been put down by the glacier. Um, some different examples um, looking at actual glaciers. Um, so you can see here this example, there are lots of different medial moraines um, that are showing up on the surface of this glacier um, coming down through the middle right here. And remember that these are formed when two different glaciers flow together. They're produced, as, they're originally a lateral moraine on one or both of those tributaries. And when the tributaries flow together, they bring that, uh, that debris with them. And you can see some examples of lateral moraines here. So this example from, um, from the Kennecott Glacier in Alaska shows a lateral moraine as well as debris cover uh, on the glacier surface itself. Um, past the terminus of the glacier, we can get what's called an outwash plain or a valley train. Um, this is just the, the large plain in front of the glacier where we have usually uh, meltwater streams forming. And we often see these forming as braided streams. So they're uh, streams that have lots of sediment in them. They change course quite a lot um, and they sort of spread out over a large area, um, some different uh, examples that you can see here on this slide. Um, here, I just wanted to show another, um, just another view of this and point out that you can also see plenty of glacier sediment in these, um, in these lakes that have formed um, in front of the glacier. So these depressions that have filled up with meltwater and you can see this sort of characteristic milky color uh, that I mentioned in the previous lecture. Another glacier landform uh, is what's called an esker. And this is a long, narrow, winding ridge uh, that's composed of mostly sorted sand and gravel. So we know that they're deposited by meltwater that is flowing either on top of stagnant ice. So if this is ice that is not flowing, it is just sort of sitting there. Um, it can be flowing on top of the ice. It can be flowing in the ice or it can flow under the ice. Um, they don't typically contain fine sediments because those are carried away by the water. Um, you can see here the water uh, that's moving away from glaciers uh, in meltwater streams like this one in the far distance uh, is carrying a lot of that fine sediment away, but the, the larger sands and gravels can get deposited uh, in, these, in these sorts of features. Um, so these are indications that ice was stagnant or very nearly stagnant, so not flowing very fast at all, uh, which can be useful in reconstructing ice sheet behavior. It can also be useful in reconstructing the behavior of more modern uh, glaciers. Um, and some of these features, like the Eshke Riata um, in Ireland, which runs between Dublin and Galway Bay uh, can be hundreds of kilometers long. So these can form uh, very long linear features in the landscape. Another uh, feature or another type of glacial deposition uh, is what's called an erratic. Um, so these are large boulders or larger clasts uh, that are picked up and moved by the glacier and then they're deposited either in or on top of till. Um, they're called erratics because the lithology, so the, the material that makes up the rock uh, is different from the bedrock where we find them. Um, so they're, they're these very, as, as we were learning more about ice sheets and past glaciation, um, they, were sort of looked at as these very weird rocks that just sort of showed up 
uh, you know, in the middle of a field where there's no mountains and no anything uh, for hundreds of kilometers around. Um, so they, they, you know, they've, they've been moved a uh, very long distance by, by glaciers. Uh, they can be moved sometimes hundreds of different kilometers. Uh, so this example of a very large glacial erratic in uh, Alberta has been moved a few hundred kilometers out from the Rocky Mountains and deposited in uh, the plains to the east of the Rocky Mountains. And it is a feature that is nine meters tall, as you can see marked here. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's about 18 meters wide and about 40 to 50 meters long. So this is a, this is a rock the size of an apartment building that has been moved by a glacier. So the glaciers can move very, very large objects um, over fairly long periods of time. Um, another feature that gets left behind by retreating ice is what's called a kettle lake. Um, you might also hear them called kettles, kettle holes, potholes. Um, so these are lakes that form when you have blocks of ice that detach from the glacier. Um, so they are either, you know, they're stranded, stagnant pieces of ice that have uh, separated from the main glacier. Um, they're deposited in a layer of sediment or on top of a layer of sediment, um, and they fill in around uh, with some more glacier sediment. Um, when the ice melts, you then get a depression that forms um, in, the, in the sediment where this ice has been deposited. And over a period of time, uh, because you have a depression and a fairly flat landscape, they can fill with water forming a small lake. These are typically fairly small um, features, so less than a kilometer or two in diameter, and typically less than 10 meters deep, although they can be uh, significantly larger than that. Another feature that forms sort of in conjunction with kettles is what's called a came. Uh, this is a hill or a mound of stratified drift that has sort of an irregular shape. Um, and it's formed by sediments that are deposited in meltwater. So it's meltwater that's flowing on top of the glacier or along the sides of the glacier, um, depositing sediment. And then when the glacier melts away, uh, you have this sort of irregular shaped pile of sediment that's uh, that's left behind. Um, and like I said, these form in conjunction with uh, with kettle holes or kettle lakes. And so you often get uh, in formerly glaciated environments, you get what's called a uh, came and kettle topography. Um, so this is probably a good place to just uh, take a pause. Um, you know, look back over some of the different slides, and then uh, you can go ahead and continue the, the video after that. Okay, welcome back. Um, so we've talked about the different landforms that can be created as they are deposited at the front or in front of glaciers as they're retreating. And we're going to move now to talk about bed forms that are, are landforms that are formed underneath the glacier um, that are then revealed as the ice retreats. So these are called subglacial bedforms, and they form uh, they can form either uh, longitudinally, so in a direction that is aligned with the flow of the glacier, uh, or they can form transversally, so where they're perpendicular or across the flow of the glacier. And these are accumulations of sediment. They form under active, so flowing ice. They're made by ice flowing over a layer of sediment or bedrock. Um, we often classify them based on their size, based on how elongated they are, um, but they taken, in, taken as a part of a whole, they reveal the flow patterns of ancient ice sheets. Um, and we'll talk more about how we can try to interpret some of that uh, further on in the lecture. Um, in addition to telling us about past ice sheets, they can also tell us about 
the different processes that are ongoing underneath present day ice sheets. So the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, which is very important for understanding the long-term stability of those ice sheets. So the first feature that we'll talk about is what's called a flute. So these are, these are landforms that are typically on the scale of tens of meters long, uh, less than a meter high, and about a meter or so wide. So you can see this example here, these ridges, or sorry, these furrows, and then you see the fluted landform uh, in the middle. So these uh, have a fairly low preservation potential because they're not very big. Um, they're not, uh, they're usually unconsolidated sediment, which can erode over longer periods of time. Um, and the way that they begin, uh, or at least the way that we think that they begin, is starting with a large boulder that gets sort of stuck in the sediment layer underneath the glacier. And as the glacier continues flowing along, uh, sediment fills in the cavity that forms on the downstream edge of that boulder. Um, so this example or this figure here on the left just shows a larger scale look at some of these features. Um, and this on the right gives a schematic idea of how flutes uh, form. So you have a, an, a boulder that is embedded in the ice. It gets stuck in the layer of till at the bed. And as the ice continues flowing, it builds this cavity that is then filled in um, by sediment um, over time. And then that's left behind as the glacier retreats away. You can see here on this um, radar image, um, so this is where someone has taken a ground penetrating radar and taken it across uh, an ice sheet. And so we see the different reflection layers, these dark and light stripes tell us where different objects are within the ice. Um, so here we see there's some internal reflectors at about, oh, what is that? Couple hundred meters, um, couple hundred meters somewhere in the ice. Uh, then we get down to the bottom of the ice where you see this first uh, big transition after that internal reflector. And so this is where the bedrock is or the sediment layers at the base of the glacier begin. And you can see starting at about here, we have this, this layer that happens or this layer that, that appears in this radar image. Um, and you can see there is a feature on the downstream edge of this um, of this feature that is made up of different sediment. Um, so you can see different layers in this, which might be depositional horizons. Um, it seems to be softer material based on the, the properties of the radar signals coming back. And so it looks like this is a flute sort of feature uh, that is forming underneath the ice uh, that we can actually see using ground penetrating radar, or ice penetrating radar in this case. Another important uh, glacial feature that tells us about how ice sheets flow or past ice sheets have flown are what are called drumlins. And so drumlins are these sort of rounded hills. The classic shape of a drumlin looks sort of like if you turn a spoon over uh, or Sometimes people talk about it like it's a, an egg buried in sand. Um, and these uh, form, or the, the classic shape that forms is where you have a short, steep stoss side to the uh, drumlin. So again, this is the upstream side of the feature. And then a much longer tapered um, lee side of the feature. So again, this shows us the ice is flowing in this direction because this is the sort of shorter edge and this is the longer edge. Um, they usually form in clusters, uh, which are called drumlin fields. So typically drumlins are composed of glacial drift. So again, this is clay, sand, 
gravel, um, all of the different components that we talked about in the previous lecture, um, and they seem to form in different ways. So some of them seem to form depositionally, where we have layers of sediment that are deposited at different times, and some of them seem to be formed erosionally, so where we have a either a bedrock layer or some um, some already existing sediment layer that is eroded away as a result of the um, of the movement of the ice. Others, as I said, are, are composed completely of bedrock. And these drumlins form somehow through the interaction of the ice and the sediment and water underneath the ice, um, but the exact formation mechanism is still unclear because they seem to form in different ways with different materials, it's very hard to come up with an explanation that covers all of those different processes. Uh, and this picture uh, from a recent paper uh, about a drumlin field that was just, um, just revealed uh, in front of a glacier in Iceland. So as this ice has retreated, it has actually revealed a small drumlin field. This is one of the only um, modern, like sort of examples of a of, of us being able to see a drumlin field forming almost live, if you will. Um, so this has been a, an interesting area of research where it shows uh, some of the different features of drumlins very shortly after they have been revealed by the retreating ice. Um, and you can see here just a couple of different examples uh, here on the left. We see uh, a drumlin field, uh, I think somewhere in, uh, somewhere in Arctic Canada. And you can see there's all of these different drumlin features formed in different clusters. You can see some uh, examples where there's sort of features that appear to have somehow been cross-cut. So where we've had changes in ice flow over time. Um, and you can see that in general, or hopefully you can see or understand why I will say that the ice was flowing from the uh, upper right here towards the lower left. So it's sort of a, uh, towards the southwest, if you look at this image, uh, being on a north, uh, north and north, south, east, west axis. Um, if I turn your attention to this image, this is just an example of how this sort of complicated drumlinized feature might form. So in, in this first phase of ice flow, we have a drumlin feature that forms um, either, it can be some different features that we'll talk about in a minute, or it might just be a very large drumlin. And after some period of time, um, uh, the ice changes flow direction, or maybe the glacier has retreated and then readvances from a slightly different direction, uh, and you get new drumlin formation on, that is superimposed on this older landform. It can weaken that, um, that older landform, and eventually what you end up with is this sort of series of drumlins that kind of uh, keeps the old shape of the initial landform, uh, but you can see that there's been some sort of change happening over time. The next subglacial feature that we'll talk about is called a megascale glacial lineation. As the name suggests, these are large scale, so forming on scales from 10 to hundreds of kilometers in length. Uh, they're big linear features in the landscape. Um, they tend to form this convergent flow pattern, so going from a wider, uh, from a wider flow field into a more narrow flow field. Um, they tend to be very difficult to see from the ground and even from air photos because of the, the scale involved. Um, but when we look at them from satellite images, they're very clear. Uh, you can see this example from uh, somewhere in Canada of very obvious uh, linear features in the landscape. Um, we also know that they tend to form very rapidly. So they have to form on a scale of less than 100 years. 
and they're forming under very fast flowing ice. So under ice streams, these are, remember the, um, these are fast flowing regions of an ice sheet. Uh, so moving anywhere from 10 to maybe a hundred times faster uh, than the surrounding ice. Um, so this is what one of the features from the satellite image on the previous slide looks like uh, on the ground. So this person is standing on top of one of these mega scale glacial lineations, and it's very difficult to tell that there was much of anything. Um, it's very hard to, to see this feature. The landscape looks fairly flat. And even as we go up into an airplane and look at some of these features, uh, it's still fairly difficult to see and understand the scale of what it is that we're looking at. Um, so this is one advantage of now having loads of satellite images to actually look at and study these landforms. So the next subglacial feature that we'll talk about is what's called a ribbed moraine. So all of the features that we have discussed so far have formed longitudinally. So they've formed along the flow of the ice sheet, um, whereas ribbed moraines are forming transversally. So they're forming across or perpendicular to the ice flow. Uh, these are found in areas that are formerly covered by large ice sheets. Um, so uh, plenty of examples here in Ireland left by the, uh, the last Irish ice sheet. Um, also examples of, from the Fenniscandian ice sheet in Sweden and Finland. Uh, this example here is showing, uh, showing classic ribbed moraine features in sort of central Sweden. And you can see that uh, the ice is flowing or was flowing in this sort of northwesterly direction. And you can see these features that are forming sort of in a more uh, southwesterly or almost southerly uh, direction. Um, these sort of island features that have, uh, that, that are sticking up out of this lake uh, where they're much easier to see, uh, but there are plenty of examples that have not been uh, that are not islands in a lake. Uh, there, we can look at examples of uh, dry landforms, if you will. Um, also examples from uh, the Laurentide Ice Sheet in Canada. And these are formed or were formed in, in the core or the central areas of the former ice sheets. Um, so they're not forming near the edges of the ice sheet. Uh, they're they're forming sort of in the in the interior in these regions that are typically very slow flowing. So there have been a number of different suggestions for how ribbed moraines form, uh, including that these are ripples that actually erode in the ice that then fill in with sediment after large subglacial floods. Um, there's also uh, another proposed mechanism that these are uh, landforms that were pre-existing and after the glacier changed direction, they reshaped. Um, we showed a, an example of what that might look like with the uh, drumlin formation or drumlinizing uh, formations. Um, another proposed mechanism is through the shearing and stacking of sediment layers or the fracturing of a frozen sediment layer. So you have sediment that's frozen, and as the ice is sort of flowing over the top of it, it's pulling and breaking that sediment layer apart, and then what's left is this sort of uh, jigsaw puzzle shape. Um, they have very diverse morphological characteristics. Um, a study about 10, 15 years ago or so uh, looked at large groups of these features over parts of uh, northern Canada, parts of Sweden and Ireland, and found that they have a lot of different forms to them, um, and suggested that they might be related to instabilities in the coupled flow of the sediment underneath the glacier, 
the water that moves sort of underneath the ice and on top of and through the sediment, as well as the flow of the ice itself. So there are plenty of examples of uh, flow instabilities in nature that are formed by different materials, but they look similar because of how they form, the mechanism uh, with how they form. So you see this top example here where we have these sort of um, ribbed features in a cloud layer, a uh, thin cloud layer up in the sky. Uh, similarly with the sand ripples that you can see here sometimes left on a beach or um, in sort of slower moving uh, parts of a river. Uh, you can also see other flow mechanisms or flow instabilities uh, in this cloud layer here, as well as uh, some other examples here. So this is this is to say that um, all of these different features, this, these different cloud layers, these sand ripples, they they have a similar look to them. They're all formed in different materials, but they're all formed in somewhat similar ways, and so the thought or the sort of direction uh, that, that it's heading in in terms of explaining how ribbed moraines form seem to be that it's, it's somehow a result of an instability in this flow underneath the, underneath the ice sheets. Um, you can see that these are also forming often in um, in conjunction or very near to other bed forms um, underneath former ice sheets. So you see, for example, large mega scale uh, glacial lineations that are flow that are forming fairly or not that are forming not so far from other examples. We see some mega scale lineations here, uh, some elongated drumlins. Um, some different examples of ribbed moraines. Um, so all of these are forming in different places, but it informs or helps us to understand how ice sheets in the past flowed. So the different subglacial landforms that we've talked about, we've talked about them sort of as if they come to existence in isolation. Um, but we can also think of them as forming something of a continuum of landforms. So they're all manifesting under different conditions, but the same sorts of processes. You know, so they're all somehow related to the flow of ice over a layer of sediment with water intermittently uh, coming through that boundary layer. Um, they have different conditions. so. Mega scale glacial lineations are flowing under very fast flowing ice. Um, ribbed moraines are forming under typically very slow moving ice. Um, drumlins forming somewhere in between, perhaps. Uh, they all form with different conditions or different thickness and supply and types of sediment, um, but they all have something to do with the sediment layer underneath the glacier. Um, they might be forming with different temperatures at the glacier bed. So we know that when the bed of a glacier is very cold, the ice typically flows much slower because it's it's not able to sort of glide along on a layer of water, um, which is also then related, of course, to the meltwater availability, how much water there is to help the glacier slide along on the bed. Um, so each of these different landforms are sort of a family of a family of landforms that tell us something about processes that were ongoing underneath past ice sheets. So let's say that we want to reconstruct a past ice sheet uh, extent and maybe the different flow regimes and, and look at how uh, that ice sheet change over a longer period of time. Uh, so the different steps that we might take uh, is that we'd first actually have to map the different landforms that we see. Um, so we'd look at, for example, different moraine features, uh, end and or terminal and recessional moraines. Uh, we might look for mega, mega scale glacial lineations. 
we might look for drumlins and rib moraines and map all of these different things. We would then perhaps have to go out into the field, take some different samples, get the dating or the timing of these different features um, to, to some level of precision so that we have some idea of how long it's been since they were exposed. And then based on our landform mapping and based on uh, based on the samples that we've taken, we can interpret those different landforms and then we're done, right? And of course, the real world is not ever so simple as all of that. Um, so we'll just look at a couple of different examples from around Ireland to help us understand just how complicated all of this can be, but also uh, give us some hope that there is a way to, uh, to tease out this information as we're looking at it. So let's say we're looking uh, here in the sort of uh, north of Northern Ireland near where we're sitting in Coleraine. And you see this map of uh, different, uh, different glacial geomorphological features. Um, so I've circled here a drumlin field that's just to the sort of southeast of us here in Coleraine, as well as a, a a limit of the ice or a, a terminal moraine, uh, which is also somewhere just south of us here in Coleraine. And so this is what a, this is a hill shade of the SRTM DEM. Um, so this is a way to look at the, uh, the topography of the area. So if we're sitting here at the university somewhere, I think over about here or so, you can see Port Rush up here. So there's a very large moraine feature here, as well as a large drumlin field uh, that we can see that's formed uh, sort of just to the east of that. And so that gives us some idea that, okay, at some point this was the edge of the glacier. And then we also have this formation of the drumlin fields. And this is fairly easy because there's only a couple of these features that we might have to look at. If we move to other parts of Ireland, it's going to get much, much more complicated. So this is now again, the topography in a more central part of Ireland. And you can see all sorts of different features popping out of the landscape. We can see drumlins, we can see ribbed moraines, we can see drumlinized ribbed moraines. Um, and so we have all of these different flow patterns that have overlapped with each other, that have cross-cut each other in very complicated ways. And you can see that in this figure as well, which shows you the direction of drumlins, these black lines. So the direction that drumlins are pointing, telling us the direction that the ice was flowing. Um, you also have these ribbed moraine features that show up um, in the, the yellow here. And so what you can see um, based both on this image and then also the actual geomorph geomorphological mapping uh, is that we have glacier flow that has come sort of in this direction, as well as glacier flow that has gone in sort of this direction and this direction. So there's different flow patterns that have happened over periods of time. And we might be able to use the uh, sample dates to constrain those different flow patterns, but of course it gets rather complicated. Uh, another, what, another thing that we can do is using uh, glacial erratics. So this is an example from the south of Wales. I think Cardiff is somewhere around here. Um, and these dashed lines are the paths that erratics or different um, different species of erratic, so different rock types, uh, can be found in. And you can see this sort of general flow pattern of uh, this large ice sheet that kind of came in from the uh, north, uh, the north and west in the Irish Sea, and then flowed sort of uh, around the southern edge of Wales at some point during the last ice age as well as the movement of different glaciers in South Wales, which of course are changing uh, over time. Um, and you can see these erratic trails spread out over huge distances. So 
Uh, there's an example of an erratic here uh, near Cardiff that is transported from you know, somewhere in the far west of Wales. So it's gone, um, it's gone at least 100 or so kilometers uh, as the ice has moved it along. Um, but we can date those rocks. We can try to understand how long it's been since they have been uh, exposed and set down on the surface, and that gives us some information about when these different flow patterns were taking place. And so once we've managed to tease all of that together and put all of that together, um, we can start to look at some different models of how ice sheets flow over time, and we can use the, the dates and the extents that we have mapped to actually try to recreate some of these uh, ice sheet extents. And so this example here is from a paper that used all of the information um, that they could find around Ireland, so all of the different glacial features, uh, the different dates associated with those features, and tried to reconstruct the growth and then decay of the last Irish ice sheet. And so you see here this sort of building stage where we have potentially this ice sheet extending in from uh, Scotland and the north of England, flowing over the Irish Sea and starting to flow in over top of um, over top of Ireland. So this is starting at about 35,000 years ago. Uh, 30,000 years ago, it's now extending and creating ridges in the ice. So these are uh, flow divides. So flow is going um, so this flow divide in the middle of this glacier, this thick black line, we see that ice is flowing to the northwest as well as the sort of southeast. So sort of away from this, uh, away from this flow divide um, as the ice is extending out over the continental shelf. Uh, 28,000 years ago, it's expanded to cover almost the whole of Ireland continues expanding until about 24,000 years ago when it has uh, reach almost entirely to the continental margin off the western shore of Ireland and further south into the Irish Sea, as well as potentially flowing in over southern England. Um, and then uh, starting somewhere maybe around 20,000 years ago, it started to shrink and uh, sort of um, retreat from this maximum extent. Uh, and you can see what that progression looked like until about 16,000 years ago or so when the ice sheet, um, when the ice sheet finally uh, disappeared over Ireland. So that's it for the lecture on uh, glacial geomorphology and subglacial bed forms. I uh, have a few different things that I'd like you to have a look at here. Uh, first, you can look at the Brit Ice version 2 map um, at this address here. And that is a map of all of the different glacial landforms that have been uh, mapped over the British Isles and over Ireland. Uh, it's a massive, massive undertaking. Um, you saw an example of it on one of the uh, slides where we were looking at how complicated the flow patterns may have been over Ireland. Um, there's also two papers that came out about 10 years ago uh, looking at reconstructing the past Irish ice sheet from uh, all of the different bed forms that were mapped at the time. Uh, there's a YouTube video here uh, that you can look at that talks more about uh, Ice Age Britain, so focused more on uh, Scotland and England, but um, still gives you an idea of the different landforms that are associated with glaciation. Uh, and then there's an excellent website here at uh, antarcticglaciers.org, uh, which will have lots of information about paleo ice sheets, uh, including the, the last British Irish ice sheet, uh, the last Patagonian ice sheet, and so on. So um, I hope that this was uh, an interesting lecture for you. And again, if you ever have uh, questions or comments or concerns, uh, please feel free to email me. Thanks. Bye.